Hey, good morning. Um, it's March 8th, uh, D plus 13, uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine. Um, this map isn't quite as of uh, 1300. It's a couple hours early, so it's as of 1800 uh, Bravo time zone. Uh, so through most of the daylight hours uh, in Ukraine, actually through sunset just occurred. Um, so in the daylight right now in Ukraine, um, D plus 13, um, I'm slowing down on the frequency of these because I'm, I'm getting in on the, the borderlands um, as, a, as a military analyst there, which is weird calling myself a military analyst. Um, I guess I am, uh, <laughs> whether I want to admit it or not, right? Um, so I'm doing those every three to four days and whenever Sam needs me. Um, I'm, I'm there uh, as, as part of that. Um, all pro bono, right? I don't get paid for any of this, and that's that's fine. My none of my social media is monetized. I don't do any of that. Um, uh, this is keeps my brain engaged, and I and I hope keeps some people informed who need to be informed uh, of what really happens in in a world that is not always wholesome and good. Um, there are bad people on this planet, um, and their currency is power. So um, that's why that's why I do this. Um, but like I said, I'm slowing down the frequency of of mine because I'm I'm keeping it updated, participating uh, in the borderlands because I think that's really critical work that Sam's doing and bringing in a diverse uh, range of people uh, involved in, in in what's going on in Ukraine. Um, and he's much closer finger on the pulse. Uh, to what's going on there. Sam's currently in e eastern Poland, um, you know, having left uh, Ukraine uh, just a little over two weeks ago. So, um, but anyway, uh, some, some, I'll just go try to follow a format. Um, I'm going to change my map uh, probably tomorrow because uh, this map, what I like about this map, it shows political. <clears throat> political boundaries inside Ukraine. Uh, and then the four main colored areas I have in there are actually how Russia has Ukraine partitioned into four military districts. All right, so they have a Western military district, an Eastern military di district, a Southern, and a Northern, right? So that's how Russia's already partitioned it. And so that's that's why I, I, I've used this and, and highlighted... Um, those areas, right? Because it helped me visualize um, the campaign. Uh, what I don't like is, I, I, so I've, co I've colored in these areas, multiple maps, multiple inputs, uh, trying to get a representation here of Russia controlled terrain. Um, these are red blobs and, and that's the problem. Because uh, Russia doesn't control as much as it even appears on this map. Um, where I've red blobbed it out, um, particularly uh, in the north, the, you know, the northern half of Ukraine, not just the northern military district, uh, but, you know, kind of draw a line right here where my mouse is going. Anything north of that, Russia doesn't really control much. Um, at most, they control major highways and some minor highways. Uh, and then the train immediately to the left and right of the road. Um, that's kind of what they control up there right now. Um, you know, so to say that Russia owns this, all this terrain here north and, and west of Kiev is not entirely accurate. Um, they could, they control this major uh, line of communication coming south out of Belarus, uh, as well as a couple offshoot you know, arteries off of that, but to say they control the, that, you know, span of terrain is not entirely accurate. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to work over the next, uh, the next day or so and try to develop something that really more resembles what they control. Um, and so instead of these blobs, you're going to see roads highlighted. <laughs> Right, and they'll be colored red. That kind of shows what Russia actually controls. 
Um, now, obviously, when we get down south, we get in the, the Donbass, uh, Mariupol, Crimea. Yeah, that that's more blobbish. Um, but in the north, it's really, it's lines uh, is what you're going to see. Um, so with that, um, talk some of the key events. We're over 2 million uh, refugees have, have left Ukraine. Um, and those are not all Ukrainian. Um, right? Because Ukraine is a is, is a crossroad in Eastern Europe. Um, it's, a, it's a land bridge from Europe to Asia. Um, it's, a northern, it's a northern trade route. And, you know, historically we saw that um, over the past thousand years that trade does move across this landmass that is, that is that is Ukraine from uh, Europe uh, to the Far East. All right, so uh, this is a there's, this is a multi-ethnic, multicultural um, country and people. Um, yes, they're Kiev and Rus, but you know who are Kiev and Rus? Um, who are Tartars, right? Who, um, who are these people? Well, it's, it, it's, it's all of that. This Ukraine is all of that. Um, you know, and you know, can you look at the religious demographics of Ukraine as well? Yeah, it's predominantly, um, Greek Orthodox or, or Eastern Orthodox, uh, kind of uses a little interchangeably. There's subtle differences in there. Um, and then there are Ruthenians, right? So that's that is uh, that those are Catholics. They're in communion with in Rome. Um, then you know, so that's like ten percent of the population uh, is is Eastern Rite Catholics or Latin Rite Catholics. Uh, about ten percent of the population, um, two to three percent um, Muslim, uh, less than one percent Jewish, um, and then you then you have uh, many of your Eastern. Um, religions uh, probably the most populous of those would be Hindu uh, in Ukraine right and because we're really not that far off from India um, and that trade route so two million refugees um, so a little bit of a mix of everyone um, you know Africans uh, Western Europeans Americans uh, Ukrainian women and children all right so two million people it's a that's a huge a huge volume of, of, of people, um, predominantly in Poland, um, a significant number in Romania, um, and then Slovakia, Hungary, Germany. Some have gone into Belarus. Um, obviously, some have sought refuge in, in Russia as well, uh, or Moldova. So, but Poland and Romania are are really taking in a, a large, large number of refugees. Poland's probably well over 1 million uh, at this point. All right. uh, we've seen over the past couple days, U Ukraine um, consistently pressuring the international Western community for assistance, primarily in fixed wing aircraft and air defense systems. And so kind of what I think, and multiple sources uh, reporting this, uh, Poland, right there, uh, immediately to the west of Ukraine, their air force is predominantly MiG-29 based. They have a large number of MiG-29s, which is a, a, a good uh, fixed wing aircraft. Uh, and the Ukrainian air force is familiar with the MiG-29. Um, so what looks like is happened, Poland's gonna ship their MiG-29s to Ukraine. Like they should, because Poland should be NATO interoperable. Go figure as a NATO country. Um, so I think what we'll have is U.S. made, produced F-35s go to Poland to backfill um, their requirements so they can send their MiG-29s um, in, su in support of Ukraine. So I think that's... Um, I think that's how that's going to work out. Um and that, that's, that's logical. Um, air defense systems, I think predominantly you're going to see uh, those continue to flow into Ukraine uh, in the form of manned portable air defense systems like shoulder-fired Stinger missiles um, and, 
and probably some capability to help Ukraine uh, maintain their air defense radar uh, picture, right? Because that provides the air uh, operations picture. Um, and also, we're probably getting that feed going straight into NATO of the air of the air picture, right? So that's where I think uh, some of that assistance is going to come in for Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky's also asked uh, to shut down their airspace um, and make it a no-fly zone. But you know, you've heard from multiple people say that's a bad idea. I tend to agree. Um, making it a no-fly zone is not doesn't meet what he actually intends to say um, because it will rapidly escalate. Um, I think we're seeing some Grozny type uh, operations by Russia, predominantly in the north and Kharkiv and Chernihiv, uh, Poltava, right? Where we are seeing you know, pretty indiscriminate indirect fires into those cities. Uh, keep seeing it to a lesser degree, um, but a lot, a lot of um, area fire, cannon, rocket, predominantly rocket and missile fire uh, into large population centers in the north. All right, so it's not precision fires; it's area fires. Um, a couple things this makes me think about. Um, is uh, and I've mentioned before Russia's precision guided munitions. Uh, I think I think their PGM capability and capacity is kaput. Uh, I think they expended um, the preponderance of their precision guided munitions in Syria, uh, in Crimea in 2014, as well as in Donetsk in 2014-15. Um, and they don't have the industrial base capability to replenish uh, precision guided munitions right I think that also feeds into why the Russian Air Force is um, frankly missing from the fight um, if you don't have precision guided munitions you really don't have fourth and fifth generation aircraft um, it kind of takes that capability from them and, and we knew we know Russia has you know like Gen 4.5 like the Su 34 35 um, aircraft, but we're not really seeing the, those those fighters uh, from the Russian Air Force in Ukraine. We're seeing Su 30s a lot of those um, more Su 30s um, than you know say the Su 34. Uh, so a little bit older. Um, and loaded with conventional dumb dumb munitions um, is what we're seeing a lot of. Uh, we're seeing a lot of shot down. Um, so it tells me that Russia doesn't see, at least the Russian Air Force leadership, uh, doesn't want to commit uh, their best aircraft to the fight because without precision guided munitions, um, there's no sense in it. We have other aircraft that can that are cheaper, uh, older, less valuable strategically that can, that can drop those munitions just as well as, as our latest and greatest. Um, consequently, um, these become area weapons instead of point weapons. Uh, and once you've gone into an area weapon, your fires are appear more indiscriminate and very well, I think, in this case, are intentionally uh, indiscriminate um, as Russia is really waging a campaign of terror um, through their indirect fire and their and their air force attacks in the cities in the north. Right? It is a reign of terror. Uh, that is that is what's going on here. Um, and they have no problem leveling these cities and going Grozny style um, to try to achieve tactical and operational wins right so I see what um, what that leads to Kharkiv is one of the easier uh, targets for Russia because it's so close to the border um, and Russia is actually able to maintain um, logistics and into their units there 
Um, so that's that's a that's a classic C's. Um, it, I think it is level the city, and we'll deal with the aftermath of it later. Um, I think you also have that in Chernihiv, uh, there in the north, uh, relatively close to the border, rel and and fairly easy for Russia to target, um, and conduct ground based attack. Um, got multiple reports that uh, Mariupol is is uh, in the hands of Russia now. Um, so I've, I've drawn an op box there around uh, Mariupol. I, I think what Russia is going to want to do uh, is consolidate gains and try to close off this line of communication. It'll be a pretty narrow uh, bridge of control from the Donbass down through Mariupol. Um, also, Russia is able to project combat power out of Crimea. Um, and kind of connect this land bridge here along the south. Again, it's going to be pretty pretty thin. Um, and I, what I kind of compare it to is the game of Risk, right? When in, in the game of Risk, when you fight and you take territory, you kind of want to garrison what's behind you, or else you know your opponents are going to come in uh, and just take that terrain back. Um, you know, so that's. It's what Russia's running into. You know, they're really stretching this line of communication really thin, um, and not well supported uh, behind their their line of advance. Um, so I think that's this is going to be diff this op box right here for Russia is going to be pretty difficult to maintain this this bridge. Uh, but I, I think they have the the capability to get this. Um, where I'm watching over the next several days is, is this op box I drew over here um, with Odessa centered in it. Because uh, we know uh, here in Moldova, this is Transnistria, rough, roughly Transnistria, which is under Russian, it's Russian occupation, um, even though it's, it's, a, it's a breakaway uh, part of Moldova. Uh, but we do know that Russian special operations have been in there for some time um, affecting that, right? Uh, with about a brigade minus uh, size of Russians inside there. Um, so I think what you're, you'll see after this bridge is connected is a Russian push uh, to connect the south. Uh, it'll cut off this piece here. Um, all right, and they really Odessa is still a strategic target for Russia that they have not quite been able to achieve. They've attempted uh, Odessa early and didn't didn't get. I thought they would get it right in the first twenty four hours, um, but we're two almost two weeks into this and Russia does not have Odessa, uh, so that's a big failure on their part. I think. Um, um, I already mentioned the indirect fire and air campaign over here in the north. Uh, I forgot a K. I'm a moron. All right, but the Black Sea Fleet, uh, Russia's Black Sea Fleet is still active. Um, and, and we have seen um, the Black Sea Fleet uh, firing uh, into the south, uh, even up into kind of into central Ukraine. Um, so they have, they have ships in range who can fire cruise missiles. Uh, and hit some of these hit targets right here in, in the heartland. Um, so that is happening. Um, so watch Odessa over the next few days and see what Russia attempts there. See if uh, Russian units positioned in eastern Moldova and Transnistria uh, attack west to east and attempt to join up with uh, Russian units attacking east to west across the south. Um, that's That's a point of focus for me that I'm looking at over the next few days. Um, we'll talk some financial stuff because you can't you can't fight a war without money. Um, and so a couple days Moody's downgraded Russia to default. All right, so that's probably not good. Um, we've had seven business days now where Russian markets have remained closed. Um, because as soon as they open, they ring the bell and open their market, it's crashing. Um, 
the, the ruble is continuing to crumble. So, but, you know, basically Russia's, Russia's going bankrupt pretty, pretty fast. Uh, sanctions are working. Sanctions are, you know, Russia was not in a good economic position before this. Um, and everything that's been in place over the past two weeks is really crippling the Russian economy. Uh, we got word today, uh, March 8th, that um, the United States is cutting off um, Russian oil. Um, so I've heard 8 to 10% of U.S. oil imports come from Russia. Uh, so that will have to be made up from somewhere else. Um, and is that going to drive prices a little bit higher? Probably. Um uh, so that's that's happening on on the oil front uh, between the U.S. and Russia. I won't get too much into Mayor Pete's comment about just buy electric car and you don't have to worry about it. Cool, bro. Um, uh, other word that just came out uh, within the past hour: uh, Ukraine's power grid is connected to Russia and Belarus. Um, which is interesting that it's you know, it's it's still going, uh, but ex expect over the next seven to ten days, uh, Ukraine is going to disconnect from that network and connect into the European Union. All right, so that's that's to me that's pretty significant. All right, that's a that's a that's a tie that's remained in place for the past two weeks with Russia be, between Russia and Ukraine that. Uh, Ukraine is now uh, cutting off and, and switching um, their power distribution uh, into the EU, vice Russia, and, and Belarus. All right. So, so I'm going to pop down. I'll, 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 I'll pop down to the bottom left, right, to the interesting. Uh, what's interesting to me? Ukraine's banking system is still functional. Ukraine's critical infrastructure is still functional. There are some localized attacks and, and bits and pieces that have been degraded or destroyed, but the vast majority of critical infrastructure remains intact, functional, uh, and hooked up. Uh, Ukraine's telecom networks and internet is still functional. Right, um, and internal, internally, Ukraine rail and bridges are, are functional, minus those places where Ukraine has intentionally destroyed uh, rail and bridges. All right, but those, but Ukraine's done that. Russia hasn't. <laughs> so, uh, and and it has a military purpose, uh, where where Ukraine has destroyed rail and bridges. Um, yeah, so that's. I find that incredibly interesting that all of this inside of Ukraine still functions um, and functions well. Yeah. Um, so I'll go back over the right we'll talk questions. Um, Russian Air Force, I think we're getting a good picture of why they are not where we think they are uh, and why we still, still have air parity. Um, and Ukraine, in a lot of areas, has air superiority. Um, and I, I think it's a combination of operational readiness, uh, the lack of precision guided munitions, the unwillingness of the, of the Russian Air Force uh, <clears throat> to commit uh, their best aircraft and systems to this fight, um, knowing that they're, it's a, they would be operating those at a significant risk. Um, second question I have, where is the Russian offensive cyber capability, particularly related to uh, my interesting points, right? Ukrainian banking and critical infrastructure, internet telecom that are, that are functioning that I would have certainly anticipated Russian offensive cyber operations would be all over. Um, and we're not really seeing that. Also, we don't see what's what is happening in the realm of zeros and ones in a 
you know, a counterattack or a defensive posture in Ukraine and, and who might be helping with that that you can't really see, all right? Um, whether it's anonymous, whether it's United States Cyber Command, uh, whoever, right? I haven't really seen Russian offensive cyber operations in Ukraine. Now, I think there's great cyber defense and, there, and there's a cyber counterattack happening, if, there, if anything is, that's really keeping Russia from having an impact in the cyber domain. We really haven't seen massive attacks on critical infrastructure to destroy nodes or transmission lines. Yes, we've seen some localized attacks. We've seen an attack on a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Um, fires contained. The, you know, it's under Russian control, but it's still functional and operating. Uh, and we don't have, you know, reactors melting down. Um, I, I point out somewhat earlier today, too, that, you know, this is, this is Ukraine. This is not the Soviet Union. Chernobyl was a nuclear uh, disaster in the Soviet Union. It just so happens that Chernobyl exists in modern-day Ukraine. Um, but Ukraine's nuclear energy is, is not, you know, operating at Soviet or Russian standards. It's operating at Ukrainian standards, which are more aligned with the European Union, all right, and, and the United States and how their power, nuclear power plants uh, function and the safety controls that are in those nuclear power plants. It's not Soviet. It's Western. Um, so I think that's why you, you don't, you didn't see a nuclear disaster because uh, the controls and everything were in place to keep that plant safe. Um, you know, if it were to Russian or so, or God forbid, Soviet standards, yeah, we probably would have had a reactor meltdown. Uh, but it's not. All right, it's at it's it's too standard that we would expect in the West. All right. All right, and my, my final question there is, in, you know, Transnistria, that eastern part of Moldova that's that's Russian controlled. Uh, what's what's going on there? Um, you know, it, when, I'm not going to say, well, uh, when is Russia going to utilize their forces in Transnistria to conduct offensive operations in Ukraine? Because we really haven't seen them doing anything yet. We know they're there. But we really haven't seen anything come uh, from that southwest uh, into the southern military district. Um, so that's that's some questions I have. Uh, I kind of talked in Borderlands uh, a couple of days ago about r Russian logistics, um, and just hit on hit on Russian logistics and why um, Russia is really stalled, uh, particularly in the north. Uh, Russian logistics is rail dependent. Um, and that's how Russia was able to move and mobilize combat power uh, along the borders of Ukraine uh, in Belarus and in Russia. Um, it's by rail. They moved those combat platforms, those soldiers, and, and the initial logistics by rail. Russia's problem is their tactical logistics units are not equipped and manned to sustain the combat formations uh, that they're expected to sustain. So there's really no capability. At full strength, those logistics units have limited capability to sustain combat operations outside the borders of Russia, particularly when Ukraine severs the rail from Russia to Ukraine, right? If Russia can use rail, they can res resupply, all, you know, a much more efficiently. I won't say all day, every day, but more efficiently. Uh, when Russia cannot use rail, they have to transition logistics, classes of supply, fuel, repair parts, um, replacement personnel from rail to a some kind of hasty depot to a truck and move it forward into Ukraine. Um, they have insufficient truck capacity already because, of, like I said, their logistics formations are not capable of sustaining the combat formations that they are supposed to and designed to sustain. They're not, they're ill designed. Um, when you add into that 
this, right? 474 cars, trucks, 60 fuel trucks, destroyed, all right? Um, and that's that's not that's not that that's a that's Ukrainian reporting, but that's not far off. It's pretty darn close to that. And 60 fuel tanks out of those uh, three or four sustainment brigades that are supposed to be supporting the Russian uh, army here, uh, that's, that's roughly 50% of their fuel capacity. Um, and that's capacity. That They're at 50% capacity, not 50% uh, filled, right? So they got like 60 fuel trucks left. You know, say they're 2,000 gallon, gallon tanks. Is there 2,000 gallons of fuel in each one of those? I highly doubt it, right? So they don't have the fuel to can to sustain combat operations, and they're incapable of moving fuel um, from the rail onto those trucks and move it forward, uh, particularly the north where they've log jammed uh, the major lines of communication in Ukraine. Those are log jammed. It's hard to get anything through there because there's abandoned vehicles. There's abandoned tanks and, and bumps and everything there. So... <clears throat> Russian log is backed up and it's incapable of sustaining uh, what is what is a, what Russia is attempting to accomplish um, so just a logistics disaster uh, for Russia right? you know and you really have to maintain uh, running staff estimates uh, on everything right all, all aspects of military operations. Uh, but particularly, if you're going to do a mechanized armored push into a foreign nation, even if adjacent, and you share borders, if you don't have an understanding of what your logistics capability is, uh, it's really, to me, it's really hard to plan maneuver warfare uh, without understanding what my actual operational reach is, because that's related directly to my logistics capability. Um, and Russia's really found that out the hard way. Um, multiple reasons I think this happens. Uh, I think one thing is you're not allowed to send a bad report, right, I, in the Russian Army, um, the, in the Russian Ministry of Defense. As, as a sustainment brigade commander in the Russian army, I would not be allowed to tell uh, the army commander, uh, sir, we're, I have, I'm supposed to have 20 fuel trucks. Uh, eight of them are not mission capable. Um, and so the 12 that I do have, each has 2,000 gallons capacity, but I only have 1,200 gallons in each of them. Right? That would be an honest report, and that's what I would expect to have in the United States Army. Because that informs my decision-making as a commander. Ooh, I could probably can, should not be launching an armored assault tomorrow because I don't have the capability to fuel my tanks. Instead, in the Russian Army, my report is, sir, I'm authorized 20 fuel trucks, I have 20 fuel trucks. Each fuel truck has 2,000 gallons of, of fuel in it. We are prepared. Because the report has to look pretty, it has to look nice. That's what's acceptable in the Russian army. Um, if not, you go to a gulag or you eat a bullet in the back of the head and you get kicked into a, a ravine in Siberia, right? Uh, so I have to send a pretty report that paints a, a rosy picture. Um, whereas in the West, we think I, I would rather have the accurate report that informs my decision making as a commander because then I can I understand risk when I understand capability. Um, so that's a big big problem Russia has, right? Is you know professional honesty and integrity. Um, we have that. I hope we have that. Um, we had that inside my formations. Um, you know, Russia doesn't have that. It's not allowed. So I, I think that's put them in the position where they're at now. Um, we continue to see um, 
Western weapons, in-law, javelin, having devastating effects on Russian armor. Uh, and that's a big lesson learned for us in the West is, you know, the power uh, of an anti-tank missile. Uh, especially as a as an armor guy right here um i look at i look at you know the shots uh that ukrainians are taking with in-laws and javelins from covered and concealed positions um and just devastating effect on on russian armor right uh there's no reason to believe that anti-tank weapons wouldn't have equally devastating effects on on you know abrams challenger uh, Leo, Leclerc, it, it absolutely would. Um, those are really good anti-armor systems and they're having devastating effect on Russian armor. All right, so when I look at this chart here, it says Russian losses as of March 8th, 303 tanks. Um, you know, I'm hearing greater than 95% kill rate with Javelin in Ukraine. I figure these, the people firing the javelins are not uh, trained to a super high standard on how to operate the command launch unit. They're given a, a quick how-to, um, and I, I tell you, which every missile they shoot, they're getting better and better and better, right? So your best anti-armor uh, soldiers in the world, right here in Ukraine, right now. Uh, on employment of the javelin um that's something that you know bring that back to our formations in the west and like here's how you actually use the javelin in combat here's how you think you know how to use the javelin let me tell you how the, the javelin actually works in combat uh against tanks because uh, they're ha having great effect on on russian armor uh, so at 303 tanks destroyed um I think is pretty darn accurate, actually. Um, we know that we know the javelin's a great weapon. We've seen it tested. We've seen the video of javelin hitting a T seventy two, and there's like nothing left. It is a good weapon. It is accurate when it's, so long as the operator knows how to um, function, you know, manipulate the system to get get steel on target, and and it's it seems to really be working. Um, So yeah, that's uh, kind of where I am uh, here. Uh, D plus thirteen, um, March eighth, twenty twenty two, uh, Russia invasion Ukraine. Like I said, I'm going to update this map over the next two days and, and more accurately accurately represent um, Russia's control uh, in terms of terrain because it's not they don't have as much as this map portrays. I like the, the political boundaries uh, inside Ukraine that this map shows, but it doesn't really show the road network, which is what ties into what Russia actually controls. So I, I'm, I'm going to work on that. Uh, I kind of want to, I'm going to try to pay attention a little bit more to Russian cyber and what it has been or has not been doing. Um, because it doesn't, it's, it doesn't seem very effective. Which is, you know, equally surprising is the inability of the Russian Air Force to gain uh, air superiority. Right? Russia doesn't have cyber superiority either. Um, they don't even have parity. Like they're losing in the cyber domain. Um, so, yeah, that's a couple of things I'm going to look at before the next Borderlands cast, um, and and see if I can find anything in. in be a positive con contributor to that. So, um, kind of wrap this up, get it just under 40 minutes today. Uh, it's almost noon Eastern, so almost uh, 1900 in Kiev. And so, my as of time's a little, a little later than what it actually is, but uh, I think the key is that we're at, we're at sunset in Ukraine, and that's really the end of um, a lot of the fighting at least direct action um, and it will overnight that Russia's tended to transition to indirect fires uh, and prepare for the next day uh, actual fighting so 
Um, that's all I got for today. Get this uploaded. Um, so you should be seeing it at about 20 hundred uh, Ukraine time. All right. Have a good day. And uh, Ukraine, keep up, keep up the fight. Great work.